Hello, I'm Johnny Tucker, editor of Blueprint, and welcome to the Blueprint Innovation Interviews at ARPA. We have four interviews for you, and we'll be talking about the essential nature of innovation and what it does for architecture and practice. So innovation has been at the very core of our practice from the outset. Looking back on Nick Grimshaw's very first project to convert an old Edwardian building uh, for foreign students to come and study in London, rather than uh, tackling the complexities of working with that old building, he came up with the idea of a service pod that literally plugged onto the back of the building. And it was quite an innovative uh, piece of design that really harnessed industrial design as well as architecture to come up with a solution. And that's continued uh, throughout our work to indeed our very first large-scale infrastructure commission, which was for the uh, Waterloo Terminal uh, in London. So no uh, major station had really been built uh, for generations. And we wanted to capture the magic of the great uh, Victorian rail halls, but also it was a, had all the uh, security requirements of a major international airport, but in the heart of London. And so uh, when we really looked at the design, uh, we realized that uh, there just weren't the products there or the elements there that would allow us to build it efficiently. And so we ended up working from first principles and in many cases learnt uh, actually looking backwards. So the roof of Waterloo, which twists and turns, actually learns from the great Victorian uh, glass houses, which use glass like shingles rather than trying to uh, create a pure surface. And that allowed us to create a very economical uh, and quick to build roof. We uh, ended up designing many of the components at Waterloo. So uh, that really was the start of uh, an exploration in the relationship uh, with components and industrial design and architecture. Interestingly enough, of course, the great Victorian uh, railway halls were all inspired uh, by the glass houses that preceded them. Uh, and for us, this was to reverse as we were approached uh, by the Eden Project. Uh, and they had this uh, initial idea of creating really something quite special in Cornwall. In essence, really creating an enclosure of several acres where you could be completely immersed in a rainforest or the Mediterranean. Uh, and as we looked at the complications of uh, that uh, site, I mean, it was a magnificent site, this uh, great bowl, this old quarry, where they'd been extracting uh, China clay for nearly 100 years. Uh, and we felt the topography had to be part of the architecture. So at first we explored uh, structures very similar to Waterloo, but realized they were both quite inefficient and also just the complexity and logistics of trying to transport those large pieces of steel down to the southwest of England. And instead came up with the idea of almost creating a Meccano kit. And we'd been interested uh, in uh, tetrafluoroethylene, which is ETFE foil, as a, a new way of creating much lighter weight, high performance structures. So again, we felt in the same way as our Victorian forebears had always innovated, they'd push things to the limit looking for optimum solutions. We should create something that uses the material in the best way to create the lightest possible structure. And in many ways, I think we're, we're inspired by nature. Nature is a great teacher because nature's always trying to do things in the optimum way. And in many ways, I think that also then leads to the most elegant solution, because an optimized lightweight structure is also inherently very elegant. And that's why we find nature so beautiful and elegant. And I think innovation uh, and design ingenuity is going to be more and more important as we go forward. As architects, we have to come up with new ways of designing things, new, new ways of organizing cities, new ways of creating neighborhoods, new concepts for buildings. And all of them have to be very light in the way they touch the planet, using the minimum resource, and so that we can create a sustainable future. Back in the late 80s, we were probably one of the first practices to really explore the use of environmental systems to fashion an architecture. Uh, and that was with the uh, British Pavilion at the World Expo in Seville. So uh, last year we were approached for the uh, World Expo in Dubai uh, to uh, put forward ideas and proposals for the Sustainability Pavilion. Uh, but we felt if we could actually demonstrate what really could, can be done and create something truly sustainable in that environment, then it shows you what can be done in any environment. And of course we're living in a planet that's going to become more and more arid. Uh, it's getting hotter and drier. 
So coming up with solutions that can work in that type of challenging uh, climatic condition is becoming more and more important. And so again, I think you know, nature was, was quite an inspiration. We almost thought of the shading device over the entire enclosure that acts as the environmental system. So it's almost like a leaf. Uh, it, uh, during the day, it harness solar power through the use of photovoltaics. Uh, and it's surrounded by a series of smaller elements. So it's almost like a little forest with, a, with a larger, one large structure and then a series of smaller, necklace of smaller ones. And during the day, uh, the smaller ones even track the sun to optimize their efficiency. And so it provides all the power uh, that the facility needs. But I think more interestingly, uh, at nighttime, as the air temperature drops and the uh, moisture remains in the air, it then sucks all the water that, it, that the building needs out of the air. I think one of the things we benefit from at Grimshaw is we have quite a diverse range of different uh, skills and disciplines. Uh, as well as, of course, a core of architects. We have industrial designers, uh, we have engineers, we have urban designers. And I think that allows for a kind of interesting conversation and dialogue to go throughout our kind of de in inner design community. One of the things we, we do uh, is ask for proposals uh, of areas that people would like to focus on and research. Uh, and we ask for proposals throughout all of the studios so that we have different uh, architects, industrial designers, teaming together, looking at very focused research pieces. So innovation is a thread that runs through all of our work, no matter what scale, uh, from the micro in industrial design to the macro in urban design. Uh, and as cities become denser, uh, it's becoming more and more important to make them uh, sustainable and, of course, somewhere that we all enjoy living in as uh, populations grow and migrate into urban conurbations. And a key component to that is transportation. So in London at the moment, we're working on the Crossrail project, where we're, we've, we're looking at a, a system that combines all the platforms throughout the uh, central part of the, uh, the, low, the below grade um, station design. And we've come up with a uh, design system of uh, precast concrete panels that uh, in a way influence and, and direct people, how people move through the space and in a way reflect that idea of movement. So of course mass transit is uh, one uh, piece of architecture infrastructure that touches most of our lives every day, morning and evening. Uh, and so to that effect, I think it's important that we create something that's not just uh, seamless and works well and operates well, but is also a kind of joy to use. So when we were asked to uh, come up with uh, an entirely new station at the Fulton Center in New York, uh, this was part of the regeneration that followed 9-11. And of course, the thing about major transport hubs is they can be a great catalyst uh, for urban regeneration and growth and development. And because of the nature of the funding, uh, it was rather unusual as a, for a building uh, on Broadway in that it couldn't be built over. Uh, so it's actually a lower building than its surrounding neighbours, which meant it had a very precious commodity. It had access to the sky. And we felt the idea of actually somehow bringing the, the light and, and the sky down to everyone that used the subway could be something quite magical. Uh, and I think one of the great uh, joys in, in architecture for me is collaboration. And so at the Fulton Centre, uh, we went through an artist selection programme and I was delighted when the decision was made to bring in Jamie Carpenter. Uh, and so Jamie really became an integral part of the team uh, with ourselves and Arup on the engineering, looking at daylighting and, and the structure, uh, to come up with what was called the Skynet which is a very lightweight, highly efficient uh, stretched cable net. Uh, and on it are a whole series of perforated aluminium reflectors. Uh, and Jamie researched the actual texture and surface of those reflectors and found a material that actually reflects more light than even polished stainless steel. So the benefit there was we could actually perforate them and still reflect lots of light down, but it has this magnificent, almost veil-like uh, feel. So when you're up inside the building, you can actually look through that shell down below uh, and watch everyone moving around in the dappled sunlight. Yet when you look up, all you see is this shimmering reflector sky net.